I'm Josh Swartz. And I'm William Millingworth. Hosts of the High Tech Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another great episode of My Ed Tech Life. That's right. It's a beautiful Thursday morning here in Texas, and hopefully it's a beautiful Thursday morning anywhere in the world that you're watching us from, or if it's already Friday and it's your evening, hopefully you've had an awesome, awesome day. But thank you guys from anywhere in the world that you're watching for joining us today and for always making My Ed Tech Life what it is today. As you know, our mission, our vision, and our passion is to connect educators and creators one show at a time. And I am excited about today's conversation. I am excited about our guest who is joining us today, whom I am a longtime follower of, doing some amazing work. He's a podcaster. He's an author. He's an educator. He's a father and everything else probably in between as well. And he is into everything. And so I'm really excited to talk to David Frangilsa, who's joining us today. David, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Fonz. Excellent. Well, I'm thankful again. I know that this show is a has been in the works for a while, schedule conflicts and all that good stuff. But, you know, again, I'm so thankful that we definitely found time to coincide and have this wonderful conversation that really resonates with me. As you see the title, those of you that are watching and joining us, we're going to be talking about, you know, going gradeless. When students focus on learning, they achieve great things. And so hopefully for a lot of our audience members, listeners that are joining us live or those that will be catching this episode, you'll definitely take away some great knowledge nuggets that you can go ahead and implement into your practice today, as you know, you're going to hear it here from uh, David and what he's done. So again, also, I do want to add, David is from the Jersey area. So man, a lot of powerhouses in Jersey. Hi, huh, David. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of good things going on here. You know, um, I, I think we've learned a lot from people throughout the country because like you know, I, I've connected with uh, with you guys in Texas, you know, you, Marty, uh, people up in the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, so I, I think, uh, you know, with tech and with all these podcasts, I, I think we're getting smaller as a community where, you know, we're picking up some things that other people are doing and, you know, we're, we're running with them. Excellent. So, yeah. So I'm glad to have you here. Like I say, we do have a lot of mutual friends and we kind of, uh, are, are connected through, the same educators and educator groups. So that's a wonderful thing that like you said. And, and it just goes to show again, the power of those connections on social media and how we can continue to grow and educate ourselves uh, and hearing each other's stories. And of course, you know, just sharpening our skills. Uh, so David, um, I'm just really excited to just really get down into this conversation. But before, as always, you know, one of my favorite parts is connecting our guests with our audience members. And as you know, we, we, I always love to hear that superhero origin story. And sometimes, you know, it surprises me how, you know, people's, uh, you know, roads into education. Some, I like I mentioned, are straight and narrow. Others, you know, are very unconventional. And maybe some of them are at a fork in the road moments. But if you can just tell us a little brief background as far as how you got into education and uh, to where you are today. So go ahead, my friend. I'm sure. Learn. All right. So, yeah, I'm one of those unconventional people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when you said superhero origin story, uh, first thing that popped into my head was Deadpool, you know, because, you know, uh, for a, a bunch of reasons. First off, um, yeah, I don't. I don't look at education as like hero work, right? Um, but definitely um, in the beginning of my career, I was very much a villain. You know, I, I looked at my practices. I looked at like what I was doing and it wasn't great for students. It wasn't um, doing the things that I really wanted to instill in them and like focusing on those skills and and really helping them learn. It was more... Uh, it was very rigid. It was like, this is the way that things happen in my classroom, get on board. Um, you know, and when I take a step back, I realize how harmful those practices were, 
um and you know through reflection and through trial and error and through a lot of things that i went through um you know i got better you know and and like i'm still flawed i still like i make mistakes every day you know and so like you know uh, i'm striving to focus on learning to shift the conversations to all about okay you know what do you individually need how can i best support that um you know so that's kind of like my evolution from like you know villain to flawed you know um i i don't want to use the word here but you know um that that's kind of where i went and the other reason I, like that kind of popped into my mind is because like you said before i got my hands in everything uh, I was not always in education. Uh, I was a chiropractor before I went into teaching. So that was my background. I did that. I had my own practice for almost five years. Um, and then uh, I, I decided that, you know, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like dealing with the insurance companies and all that kind of stuff. And I had a job offer waiting for me, but I had to go back and get an MBA. So I was like, you know what? I can't do the practice and uh, go back to school. So um i had a ton of credits so i went alternate route i got a teaching certificate and i was like let me do this for two years while i get the mba and i was going to go into biotech um but i i really just love teaching within the first couple of months just the challenge of it every day is different um so i never actually um i never started the program and i've been teaching for 16 years now um so I've tried a lot of things over the 16 years. Um, a lot of them didn't work. And then, you know, probably about seven years ago, I got so frustrated that I was like, you know what? It's like everything I'm doing, it, it's just, it's not working. What's the one thing that's getting in the way? And, you know, the last hurdle that I had was grades. Like they were clouding every conversation that I had. So I was like, out of frustration, I was like, you know what? I'm done with them. Let's just get rid of them. I didn't really know how I was going to do it or like, you know, how it would work. But I was like, what I'm doing right now doesn't work. So let me try something. And so that's kind of how I got to where I am now. And over the past seven years, um, you know, we've just kind of been refining how we approach teaching and learning and building relationships with students. And um, yeah, that's kind of it. You know, and that's a very interesting story. I would have never thought, you know, just the background. And that's, you know, what I love about this segment is just being able to hear people's stories and where they're coming from and where their perspectives are coming from. So coming from your own experience in the chiropractic field and, you know, dealing with people, it's all about customer service, you know, and building those connections. So, you know, those are definitely great transferable skills into the classroom that I myself often talk about, you know, going from marketing to uh, the classroom was something that was very natural and in, in, in it's a sales job. It's about building rapport. It's building those connections. And like our friend, our mutual friend, Josh Tovar always says, you know, it's uh, connections before content. And, you know, that's something that's very important. And, you know, you were ta talking a lot about something that obviously, you know, it's, it's the title of the show that we're talking about, but it's even something that really resonates with me personally, which is, you know, just the grades going, you know, going grade list. It's, it can be very overwhelming when you have to do assessment, assessment after assessment, the work at, at, that you have to do. But at the end of the day, you know, like we were talking about uh, at pre at the beginning of the show in the warm up chat, you know, sometimes I would have an ominous, ominous stack of papers that would accumulate on the corner of my desk from one period to the next to the next till the end of the day that I could never get to because during my, you know, uh, 30 minute break, I had to be attending other meetings for IEPs and 504s and do other administrative stuff. And then, you know, at the end of the day, that stack of paper just looks so ominous. <laughs> and that's the last thing that I want to do. And like I was telling you, I, at the end of the day, sometimes I just take that huge stack and just say, okay, I'm going to put it in my filing cabinet and I'm going to come back to it. And then as the week progressed, it's like, wow, that, that, that drawer, that drawer looks more ominous and it's just like, wow. So I'm really curious, you know, as far as, you know, as you came into education, what you saw, what you were doing as far as maybe what was common practice. And like you said, you, you're kind of, I don't want to say like that, that villain, but just that person that sees things differently. Say like, how can I make things a lot easier? So 
tell me about that, you know, transitioning into your first year and kind of going into, well, this is the way it's always been done till now that shift in your mindset too, as well. Sure. So I, I, I guess to do that, I have to kind of talk a little bit about the alternate route program, which they've altered since I've gone through it. So, um, with my background, I have, uh, probably 300 to 400 science credits. So like a lot of content, like I, I knew the content really well, but I had never once set foot in, you know, an education class, or I didn't do any kind of, um, you know, student teaching, right? So there's no, um, you know, there was no infield experience. So I was kind of left to my own devices. And my first year, uh, because I was alternate route, a lot of public schools kind of shied away from me and said, you know, we've had mixed reviews with alternate route candidates. So I got a job at a charter school and the charter school, um, we didn't have labs. So I'm teaching a lab science without labs. We didn't have curriculum. We didn't like, you know, they said, okay, you know, here's the course description, order some books and build a curriculum. I was like, I have no clue what I'm doing. You know, like, so it was trial by fire. I was kind of like thrown into it. So I relied on what worked for me as a student. And like, so that was kind of the lens is like, this is how my education was. So let me reproduce that for the students in front of me. And it wasn't until much later in my career that I realized that, you know, every student is different. They have different needs. They process information differently, but you know, I just recreated what I experienced. And I think that's true of a lot of teachers is that, you know, this is the way it was when I went through school. This is the way it's always been done. So, you know, this is the way it needs to be. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really have a handle on how to relay uh, course material and content and, and build those skills. So it wound up being a very disciplined classroom with rules and like, you know, structure. And that's kind of how I got through and, you know, it wasn't effective. And so I got frustrated. I was like, all right, like these kids don't want to learn. That's the first thing you do is you blame the students. Um, it hindsight completely wrong, but that's what happens. So, um, you know, that plus some other factors, I, I went to a different school, um, and, you know, seeing some of the same things, but like there were, there were certain challenges where it's just like, you know, it was easy for me to not put the blame on myself. Right. And then I went to a third school and I'm seeing the same things. I was just like, all right, so it's not the kids. Um, you know, part of it's me, part of it's the system, right? I changed the way, like, so in the previous school, I had changed the way that I was doing things and it still wasn't working. And so then, you know, blame the kids again, blame the system, blame whatever. Um, and then I moved on and you're seeing the same exact things with three different demographics with three different, um, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds. And it's just like, all right, there's more to it than what's on the surface. And so I started digging and, you know, it, it became very clear that, you know, the, the structures that we have in place only work for a small group of people. And so I said, all right, well, my job's not to teach a small group of people. My job is to teach all the students in front of me. And I happen to teach students who have learning challenges. You know, um, I have the majority of the students that we have that, uh, have IEPs and 504s. Um, now, and I think this is a key distinction here. They are not IEP students. They are not 504 students. They are students that have IEPs. They are students that have 504s. And, you know, I, I think that language, and that's one of the first things that I changed is the way that I talk about students. Because when you change the way you talk about students, you change the way you think about students. And when you change the way you think about students, you change the way you treat them. And so like, that was kind of the first evolution that I made is just like, wait a second, you know, I need to change the way that I'm thinking about how I'm interacting and why we're seeing these hurdles. 
Yeah. yeah. No, and you know, right now I'm just taking it all in because you've hit on so many things that were are very similar to myself when I first came in, not going through the teacher prep. And to be honest with you, my alternative certification program was really like sign this paper, you are in, and we're gonna come and observe you twice. And really that's it. And then here's the practice for your modules for your test. And that was it. So really what I learned was from my colleagues around me. And like you said, it was very structured. And at the end, I just kind of reverted back to the way I saw school coming up, you know? And so you mentioned a lot of those things where this is the way I've either always seen it. This is the way it's always been done. And it, it wasn't until later on also just kind of changing things up because you realize, like you mentioned right now, towards the, the latter part of, of your statement was, your students, you're taking care of all of them. And it's very important that you take the time as an educator to really get to know your students. And you're absolutely right as far as the way that you change your language at, when you speak about your students and say like, you know, oftentimes you hear teachers say, well, they're your students. No, 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 they're our students because collectively, like they've been through this school the whole time. So there are students. And then you have teachers that say, oh, well, they're, they're not my student. They, they go to special ed, so they're not mine. But they're in your classroom. You're the tier one teacher. You're, you're, you're their teacher. And oftentimes, it's, oh, no, no, they're, they're not mine. They, they go to, to them over there and they take care of them. And it really does make a difference. And it makes an impact as far as your community in your classroom. And I have found that when I changed my practice, and again, much like you, it wasn't until a couple of years went by. And then when I transitioned into elementary, that's really where I feel like I honed in my skills to be able to work with that community and building that community and understanding my students a lot more and understanding their needs and being responsive to their culture, being responsive to the way they learn. Because like you said, they all come, students come with different learning styles. They come in with, uh, you know, different things and supports that they may need. But it really, as a teacher, we really need to take all of that in. And as overwhelming as it can be, I always say the return on investment is great. The more time you take in the very beginning to know your students, the better things will go throughout the year because you've set those expectations, you've set that, those, those rules, you put those rules in place, at, but the students feel comfortable that they can come into that safe space and know that they're going to be welcome and that, you know, they're going to be able to collaborate with everybody. And I think once I did that, this whole going gradeless part kind of transitioned and made it a little bit easier for me to be able to put the learning on their court. So kind of want to hear a little bit about that because we were talking about, you know, in the, in the pre-chat, you know, you have a book out, you know, and, and of course you, you've had this book out over what, about two years now? Uh, about a year and a half. About yeah. a year and a half. And it was about, March of last year. Okay. About a year and a half and talking about going gradeless. And you talked a little bit about the title. So tell me a little bit about what you said as far as what you people think, you know, when they hear that title of the book. Yeah. So I, I think we picked the wrong title, you know, because it's, uh, it, it's more about pedagogy and connecting with students and how can we break down barriers to learning. And the grades were just the, um, they were the last obstacle that I had in that journey. So when I say going gradeless, people think that like, you know, we got to tear down everything we do and do things totally different. And it's a system that has no rules, no accountability. You know, you know, it's, um, they look at it as a free for all and it's not, you know? Um, so if you dive into the book, it's, it's highly structured, it's accountability, but the accountability is shifted and it's more based around feedback and understanding and like you know being better tomorrow than we were today that incremental improvement over time and uh you know it's just the grade the the conversation of what do i need to do to get an a or how many points is this worth and you know having those conversations about how come it's an 89 and not a 90 you know when 
in reality, what really is the difference between those two things, you know, other than a permanent mark on a report card that changes, you know, a number that they use on their college applications, right? Because if you're saying a student that got an 89 is not as capable as a student who got a 90, I mean, that's a false statement. You know, um, so like all those little things started playing in. And when we when we stopped arguing about grades and points and collecting and, and all that kind of stuff, and we got to talk about learning and, you know, well, OK, what about this was challenging? All right. You know, what can you do on your own and where do you need my support? What practice can you do independently? What practice needs to be guided? Um, you know, and so the conversations just started to change. So like, yeah, the, the book is going gradeless and a, a lot of people have a problem with that because they're just like, yeah, but at the end of the year, you have to put a grade. That's true. However, when we put a grade, it's after all of the learning has transpired, the grade never enters the learning process and it's never part of the conversation during the learning process. Yes, at the end of the year, I transcribe that to a grade. Um, you know, it really doesn't matter to me. That's just kind of a shorthand symbol for, you know, what they've done throughout the course of the year. Um, but when I define gradeless, gradeless means that um, that never enters the discussion during the learning process, right? We can reflect and see, okay, oh, after this amount of time, how well. Um, did you achieve these really arbitrary goals that we set forth at the beginning? You know, um, cause that's really what grading is. It's um, we're judging them against a predetermined standard. Right. And like we determine what that standard is. So it's completely arbitrary and it can change. So, um, you know, and I understand it's necessary. I'm not looking to abolish grades. I'm just looking to de-emphasize them and remove them from the learning process. Mm -hmm. No, and I agree with you on that. It, again, going back to my personal experience, oftentimes it's always the students will, um, like, what's my grade? And, you know, or what is the bare minimum I need just to get a 70? And that's the effort that they're going to give you. You know, even with state testing, state testing here in Texas, you know, for maybe let's say like a sixth grader or maybe even like, let's go ninth grade, they have a, maybe like about 42 questions, maybe 46 you only need 21 to pass. So a lot of the students are like, well, I'm just going to shoot for the bare minimum just because I just want to get this over with and I don't want to take this anymore and I want to graduate. So we, I think that because of the emphasis on grades, it's like, okay, that that's the first thing they talk about. How much is this worth? Am I going to get a hundred? Why didn't I get this or the 95? So for myself, when I transitioned into elementary, it was more like you mentioned, it was, I was more into the learning and the learning process. And I think, you know, when building that community and having that communication with students, like you mentioned, it's like, hey, you know, can you do this independently or how can I support you? And really kind of being that guide on the side approach as they're taking ownership of their learning. It was very rare that I would hear it's like, sir, is, is this for a grade or sir, what grade am I gonna get or this or that? It was more like, hey, check out what I just learned or, and then they start communicating with one another. The communication opens up, the collaboration opens up, and then it just becomes where I'm just kind of sitting back and I'm just taking it all in because for the first time in as many years as I started learning or actually teaching and trying to learn new things, I'm like, wow, this is amazing where the students are taking that ownership and they're excited to say, hey, Mr. Mendoza, like, I know you, this is, your rubric, but can I do this instead? And I was like, okay, yeah, go ahead. You know, it still falls in line with what we're doing, with what we're teaching. And instead of giving them daily grades, it was more like, okay, this is the unit that we're going to cover science and social studies. Then these are, this is what we're going to cover this week. And at the end on Friday, we're going to be working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, collectively, we're going to be in groups, this is your, you know, your presentation, you guys are going to come up and present, or if it was individual, it's like, all right, guys, I mean, here is the text and here's what I need you to do with this text. Now you can give it to me in the form of a PowerPoint. You can give it to me in the form of a screencastify, 
however creative way or creative tool you want to use. But it allowed me to have, number one, documentation that learning was taking place. Number two, what I loved about it is to be able to measure growth from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, where if I had a student who is just learning the language, I can show them, look where they were at the beginning, look at what they're doing now at the end. And of course, at the end, it was just the grade. I would put in the grade based on the learning that took place, my simple rubric, and it made my life so much easier where I didn't have that ominous stack of papers and I didn't have my four drawers of filing cab of my filing cabinet full of papers there that were ungraded because now it, it just made things so much easier. Yeah, I, I think you hit on a couple of really important things there. The the first thing is the initial shift is challenging, but once you make that shift, um, it's sustainable, right? So yeah. as a teacher, it makes my life a whole lot easier. And when I'm communicating with students and parents, it's made that communication better because now instead of saying, well, you know, they have a B because they got a 70 on this test, a, a 90 on that test. And now I can say, well, you know, we're doing problem solving and they can set up the problem, but they're having a really hard time finding the equation that they need to use. Like, so I have way more information about the student that I can communicate to them as well as, you know, guidance, child study team, you know, home. Um, and so it's like when people ask me, well, how can I support my student? Hey, great. Here are the things that they might need a little help on. Here are some things that maybe you want to work with them at home on. Um, you know, so that portion right there where, you know, we're not spending our time judging We're we're evaluating and, you know, we're thinking up here are the supports that are going to get them to the next level, you know? So like that, that part is huge, you know, just shifting those conversations, not just with the student, but with everybody involved. And I mean, in the high school, like I'm sure people have experienced this, like, our, our school year ends in June. So prior to shifting to this model in May, I'd always get like, you know, guidance coming in and saying, okay, what can we do to drag this kid across the finish line? And just think about like that statement, drag the kid across the finish line. Nothing about that is about learning. Right. And so now I can tell you in October, November, here are the things that this student is having trouble with now. Let's put some supports in place so that we can actually close that gap, right? Provide that skill and give them the best chance at success moving forward. Now, the majority of times it works well. Sometimes, unfortunately, students make choices where it's just like, okay, you know, you don't want to engage in the practice. You don't want the, the help that's being offered and that's their choice. And we have different discussions at that point, but everything's a discussion. So, you know, when you talk about relationships, I think people also have the misconception that relationships is, is we're going to be buddy, buddy, you know, it's like, you know, it's not, Oh, Hey Fonz, like, mm -hmm. you know, great job. And like, you're my best friend. Call me after school. Like, it, it's not that it's just, when we talk about relationships, we're talking about actually knowing the student, knowing what that student needs and how they best respond. Right. So. Um, I don't typically have, um, any challenges with, with people who have exhibited behavioral, um, you know, outbursts in school at, because I communicate with them on a different level, you know, um, it, it's just, I understand like, you know, we have a conversation. It's not yelling at them. It's like, all right, why'd you choose to do that? Like, what, what was the point? Can you just tell me? what you hope to accomplish by taking that action, you know, and you know, we'll talk about why that's not appropriate. We'll talk about all those things, but you know, it's not punitive. It's conversations. They make choices. We have conversations and then say, next time you're in this situation, try and make a different choice. When we talk about relationships, I mean, that's what we're talking about. Like they need to know that they're seen, they're valued and you understand them, right? Not that you're their best friend. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. And, you know, that, <laughs> I just loved it. Like in the last four years of me in the classroom was really much 
like you're saying. And a couple of things that you hit on that I feel that were so valuable that I learned was when you actually get to know the student and you go before, let's say that that student had some supports and you have to go into a meeting and say, okay, this is what the student has as far as a 504 or an IEP. Oftentimes, you know, we, we're teamed up and some teachers come in. They're like, well, these are the last grades that they had. And then I would come in and I'd say, well, this is what I'm noticing and this is what I'm seeing. And here's the artifact. And I can go that specific to say, hey, you know what? Although they may not be understanding this concept, you know, in that class, in my class, this is what I see that they're doing and in the, getting very specific and granular to what the student may need. And at the end, it was like, oh, okay. Because oftentimes, you know, like you said, it's very important to be able to communicate with all your stakeholders, how your students are doing. And especially with parents, parents are like, well, you know, this is what they got on the last tests and that's it, you know, well, really, but, but what, when they get the, when I would get a phone call and say, well, what specifically, oh, like you described, well, it's this concept, they're able to do this, but this is the little part where they're lacking. And oftentimes it could be a misconception that they had. And as a teacher, you know, upon reflecting, say, okay, you know what, this was on me, but I don't have to reteach it to all 30 students. I had two or three students that I would just sit down with, catch them up, and they're up to par with everybody else because of those misconceptions. So to me, that's what relationship is, is really getting down to, like you said, getting to know your students, getting to know their that little deficiency that they may have in a concept, just being able to talk it out with them. But like you said, you know, oftentimes it's, like, oh, you know, hey, buddy, buddy, this and that. No, you know, it's within the classroom. And I found it to be so useful and so great. And it just made my job a lot easier. Sure. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I guess I, I should probably talk about how I structure the class so that yes. it, it allows this to happen. Um, so there is structure. And you talk about rubrics. And I started with rubrics, but I found them to be limiting. Right. I, I found them to be check boxes and I was getting like 24 of the same thing. And um, but I, I do like that structure. Um, I've seen single point rubrics been brought up, but when you're talking about students who need a little more support and guidance, I think it falls flat of telling them what happens, like how do they get to that proficient? So, you know, we took a lot of this information. We have the structure of a rubric, but now we have learning progressions. All right. So um, the language that we use is not enough evidence, beginning, developing, proficient, advanced, and expert. And so there's a progression through skills. Content is the vehicle um, through which we do this. And we have a, a very set structure. Um, any content that we do, I don't care what you're talking about. If, if you're a baseball fan and you don't know the rules or terminology of baseball, um, like you, you can't have a conversation with somebody, right? Um, you know, if I were to be on the set of a play and, you know, they're giving me stage directions, I'd be completely lost because I don't know that language. So we start every unit with what we call our foundational understandings. And those are all the things that you're going to need to know in order to have a conversation about this topic. So we go from that to, um, we call the narrative representations of the concept. Um, then we go to pictorial representations. Um, then we go to graphical and then we go to mathematical and we cycle through, um, you know, it's that same kind of loop for everything that we do. Um, now at the beginning of the year, we're just trying to get foundational skills um you know so we broke it up based on the ngss science practices so there are things like asking questions uh solving problems engineering design um you know um, experimental design data analysis things like that so we have um all of these learning progressions in these skills and the content whatever content you're studying it fits into that so rather than redoing and going back we reassess with each unit and say okay um you know this is the level that we're focusing on now here's the practice that we've provided so um you know in september um 
September, October, um, you know, we're looking at maybe getting to the developing level. And then in that skill, when we're in January, February, we're looking at getting to the proficient level. And then not until the end of the year are we looking to get to advanced. And that expert level um, is maybe for like an honors or an AP course. So we use the same structure throughout all levels of, um, you know, our physics classes because physics is physics. It doesn't change, right? So the, the level that we're looking for at a certain point in the year, um, based on the practice that's provided, we can now provide feedback and it, it's step-by-step. Step. And the beauty of this is we don't show them what's next because if you've ever had a rubric, you know that students look at the five on the rubric and they say, I want to do that. And they ignore everything else. So if our target is developing, that's all they see. They see beginning and developing with proficient and everything higher completely blacked out. And so it's like, don't worry about that. That'll come later. But knowing what's next, the students who are ready for that, I can coach them to those next levels without that being the requirement of the course or the expectation of the course at that time. So everybody's being appropriately challenged without thinking they're behind or thinking I need to do something that I'm not ready for. Um, and, you know, like that has definitely, um, that's definitely helped us. It's given us, um, you know, concrete language where we can talk about learning. So um, I guess to, to give you an example, when we're talking about creating explanations. So in order to talk about the explanation, the first thing that you have to do is actually respond to the prompt. So our beginning level is I wrote an explanation that showed like, you know, my reasoning for getting that answer has nothing to do with physics. I just, I wrote an answer and said why I think that's the answer. And that's our beginning level. Say, okay, great. So Fonz, you wrote this answer. Next time, could you bring in some of the physics terms that might relate to this, right? And so now the next time you respond, say, oh, okay, you know what? I remember Newton's second law said something. So here's my answer. Oh, okay, great. You identified Newton's second law. Next time, if you just said what Newton's second law states, that might be a little helpful. So now you're expanding. Say, oh, you know, Newton's second law that says that acceleration is directly proportional to force, inversely proportional to mass. So here's my answer, right? And we're kind of guiding them through this progression. And for some students, it's quick, right? For other students, it takes a little longer, but it doesn't matter, right? It's still that progression we can identify where each individual student is in that progression and give them the feedback to get them to their next, um, you know, developmental level. And, you know, you'll find that some students, um, they do really well in explanations and like maybe they're at proficient or advanced and, you know, they need a little more help in problem solving. And for other students, it's, it's different. And some might be great at lab skills, but need help with engineering. And so, um, you know, we have pretty much like, here are the activities you can do, right? Pick the one that you need to hone skills on based on our targeted level of development. And, you know, we're helping different students with different things. And for me, it keeps it fresh, you know, because I'm not doing the same thing every day, four periods a day, you know, each conversation is different. We, you know, and the students break up into groups based on what they need to do. If some people are working on problem solving, they'll get in that group. And, you know, so depending on the day, um, it's not like set groups of people working on the same thing. So kind of mixes up the class too. I love that. You know, and a lot of that who you were saying, I, right now I'm currently doing some, some coursework. And of course our professor gives us a rubric. Well, the first thing I do, like you mentioned, it's like, I go straight to the five. Okay. That's what I need to do. And that's it. But, you know, at the same time, you know, talking how you were saying, you know, you're, you're taking it one step at a time. Uh, one of the things too, even as an adult learner, you know, coming into these courses where I get professors where at the end, they're like, okay, at the end, you're going to have this 50 page research paper. And they'll tell you that in the beginning. And it's like, oh man, everybody's like, you know, it's that class. 
But then they're like, but wait, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to build it. So each course or each time that you come in, we're doing one piece and so on, because I, I love that model because it what you were saying, when you're working with a student where they may be able to write just a little bit of the concept and then you're working with them and saying, okay, maybe next time add this. They're building up their knowledge. They're building up the vocabulary. They're doing so much. And so it really reminded me of professor that I have that this is what we do. And this is a way we're going to go ahead and build your paper. So at the end, you know, you don't even worry about the rubric. You know, you should all already be at a five because I'm giving you that feedback and doing all of that. And so I love that structure, the way that you do it. And again, you know, like you said, I, I can see why people can say, oh, great list. Oh, no, forget it. You know, like, I don't even want to listen to this, but there is structure. There is a method. Sure. And I absolutely love that. And I thank yeah. you so much for really breaking that down, uh, you know, so people can have a greater understanding of that. Thanks. And so in, in my mind, the worst thing that you can say to a student is no, or that's wrong. Because the instant they hear that, they shut down. And, you know, we found a way where they're never wrong. You know, maybe the answer isn't the best answer, but like it's, okay, what can we do to modify this answer so that it better addresses the question that was asked? You know, and so, um, you know, we try not to just shut them down and say, nope, you're wrong. Uh, here's the right answer because like with this structure, it's like, okay, great. You know, here, here's where, um, here's where you're at. Here's what you can add to advance. And, um, you know, that was one of the biggest changes because like I said before, I teach a lot of our students that have IEPs and 504s and they're so used to being wrong. Then you say, oh, okay, great. Um, great answer. Here's how we can make it even better. They're just like, oh, wait. I, I did something good, you know, and they want to do more good. And like, you know, so it's just, um, it, it, it's worked for me. Um, you know, and we've, I, I wouldn't say we've scaled it, but like, you know, it's definitely, there are other people using this model that it's worked for. Um, I wish there were more, um, you know, but, um, it's definitely a lot of upfront work, but it's totally worth it. No, definitely. And I, I agree with you. I love it. I love the concept. And, you know, it, to me, it just seems something so natural to me. But again, I, I, much like you, I, I'm one of those that it, it always likes to go against the grain. But at the same time, if I see that it's going to be something that's going to build up my student and it's not so much like, oh, I just don't want a grade. No, no, no. It's about the learning. And like you said, just breaking down those barriers where instead of the student coming in saying like, hey, um, you know, what do I need to do just to get a 70? It's more like, hey, what do I get to do today or what do I get to build on from yesterday and build up to for my final product? And they get excited and that collaborative aspect the communication between teacher and student, the communication between teacher and, of course, you know, your admin and the parents knowing full well in detail what that particular student may need and having a nice explanation other than well, these were their last five grades on their quiz and that's why they're here. Okay, but what could they do better? Oh, well, they just need to do better on the exams and that'll be it. Study I've seen more, it, work harder. You know, study more, work harder and not really dialing in on, on what the student really needs. And I want to give a shout out to some of the, you know, our friends that are joining us live. We've got John Woodward from Texas. So John, John might be hitting you up, David, to meet okay. you on his podcast because he's a podcaster too. Thank you, Lois, also for joining us. Another uh, uh, fellow educator from the, the Jersey area. So thank you. And we've got Sherry Fleischer, uh, who's joining us on LinkedIn. And we've got Mel, who uh, linked in or logged in from Colombia as well. And Samantha, Samantha Schaffner also for joining us. So thank you so much for joining us and contributing to the conversation today. And David, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful time and getting to know you more, your, your style, and really knowing a lot more about what you're doing and the concept of your book and the structure that there is, you know, so guys, please make sure that you do pick up a copy of David's book. And uh, David, please let us know where it is that number one, our audience members can go ahead and get a copy of your book. And number two, how our audience members can connect with you. 
Sure. Um, so you can get the book on Amazon. Uh, it's going gradeless, shifting the focus to student learning. Um, I'm on Twitter. That's probably the the best place to find me. I'm not huge into social media. Twitter is the only one that I can really handle. I can't do more than one. Um, I do have a blog at reimagineschools.com. And um, I have a podcast, which you can also find uh, there or wherever you get your podcast is called From Earning to Learning. Um, and the, the way we got that title was trying to shift the focus from earning points and grades to true learning. So that's kind of why I titled it that, but, um, I will be at the teach better conference in Ohio, um, in October. So I'll be speaking there as well. Um, you know, I spoke at NSTA and, uh, you know, I'm doing some conferences. So, um, if you're ever running through Jersey, uh you know drop me uh drop me a message i i'd be happy to to talk to you excellent well thank you so much david i really appreciate your time and i did put some of those links up here and of course they'll be in the show notes as well so make sure you pick up david's book make sure you check him out on the podcast follow him on on uh, social media as well as he does do a lot of collaborative work also with other educators and other you know he does a lot of podcasting and just reach out to him if you ever have any questions you know that's what we're here for and that's the whole problem uh you know purpose of the show is just to connect educators and creators one show at a time. So David, now we're down to my favorite segment too as well, which is the last three questions that I love to ask all my guests. So hopefully you're ready for this one. So here we go. Question number one, in the current state of education, what would you say is your current edu kryptonite? Yeah. So this one, this one's tough. Like there, there's a few. Um, so I think right now, all of the outside stuff that has nothing to do with education that's leaking into schools um, is really reducing focus. Um, and it, it's there's a lot on our youth of today that they're dealing with more than we ever had to. And I don't think we realize what toll it's taking on them. And so that's making things a little more challenging, um, you know, but something that's persisted even beyond that, that that's more of a, a recent thing, but um, it's the, you know, well, this is the way we've always done it mentality. That is uh, by far the one that um, we will be dealing with for our entire careers. Hopefully um, this passes and we can get to, um, you know, more normal times where students aren't bombarded with so many things but i think that second one the business as usual mentality um i mean that's just so draining you know and you you can show people a better way and show that hey look you know it's it's not harder you're just focusing your energy in a different place and people have a really hard time if i do something different it means i'm wrong you know, and it, it doesn't, it just means we know better, we do better. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, <laughs> I'm one of those, I'm with you on that. You know, this is the way we've always done it. And working at a school district and seeing things from, you know, bird's eye view, I'm just like, why, why do we continue to do this? Why do we continue to use programs that aren't working? Why do we continue with this practice? And, and I see this also where, like you mentioned, it's like, if we ask a teacher to, hey, you know what, instead of doing the standard algorithm as your standard practice, how about let's add some math manipulatives, you know, and do some concrete pictorial abstract models. And, oh, no, no, it's just too much. It's, I don't have time. It's too hard. And it just really it makes things a lot easier. And, and so if I ask you to maybe try something, it's going to be because it's, it's going to make your life a lot easier. But yeah, you know, sometimes you do get that mentality of you always revert back to your comfort zone and, you know, do it the way that it's always been done. And hopefully we can get some more change agents to be able to come in and change things and, you know, and for the better, because it honestly, it is for the better. All right. Question number two, here we go. My friend, if you can have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? trust students to know what's best for them, you know, and the, the reason for that is we, 
we tend to impose our views, um, but we're seeing students for a very small portion of the day, you know, and what they're presenting to you is what they've kind of figured out you want to see. So you're not like, yeah. And part of that is, you know, building relationships and we can get past that, but like they're presenting a, a piece of who they are. They're not presenting, you know, their whole self. And so, you know, they know better what they need than we do. And so just be there to kind of provide that. Excellent. Good one. Good one. Love it. And the last question, David, I know you're a podcaster. Yep. So let's say I was either on one of your podcasts that you do. I know you collaborate with so many, but let's say that this was your show this morning and you had one question for me. What would your question be? Well, I do want to have you on my show at some point, <laughs> but um, I know you are a big proponent of Web3. So what is what do you see the single biggest impact of Web3 being on education? Ooh, the single biggest impact for me uh, for Web3 on education. Actually, I posted something earlier today in response to um, Web3, and I just put here, I'm just going to go ahead and read it out loud because this was just a thought that I had. So Web3 could be used to create more personalized learning experiences for students by tracking their progress and providing feedback based on data collected from sources like learning algorithms and social media, things of that sort. So for myself, we are all connected. So web one, you know, you're connecting to information. Web two, you're connecting to information and people, you know, kind of like what we're doing. Web three, now you're, you know, connecting with um, information, with people and with devices. You're connecting with anything that is around you. So imagine if there is a student in your class that loves, you know, either playing video games or loves a certain type of activity, you as a teacher, I always think it's like, well, what can I do in knowing my student and knowing their particular interests so that I can tap into that into my classroom? So if there was a way to be able to do that based on this information in Web3, then I could be better personalize the learning and get even more granular than what we can actually do. So for me, it's just that power of connection, that power of personalization. So um, it's going to be something that it will be big. And of course, we, we already see it a little bit with, you know, some of the LMSs or some of the platforms that we see where a student will kind of continue to grow. And if there's a concept, it'll kind of bring them back down either to one level below and things of that sort. So in a way, this idea is nothing that is novel. It's just, it seems new because now it's like, okay, Web3 and we're connecting all these things, but it will have a significant change for education. And I truly believe it will be for the better as now, you know, our data, we're going to be owning our data. We're going to have ownership of that. And again, for the learning process, I think it can definitely do some wonders. So I'm really excited about the future of learning, excited about the future of work. And, you know, there's a lot of great things to come. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much as always, you know, for really making my morning and just filling my bucket today with everything that I learned today. And for all our audience members as well, as they took a little bit of, or actually a lot of knowledge today, as far as hey, going greatless just doesn't mean like, hey, you just randomly give grades. Oh, I mean, there is a structure, there is a method to it. And I promise you, if if you read this book and you add and sprinkle a little bit of this into your current practice, you'll see that there'll be definitely be a change. And it's a, a wonderful welcome change because you're going to see the way that, that uh, you know, like David mentioned, breaking down those walls and barriers as far as grading and the learning. So when you actually focus on the, when the students focus on the learning, it's going to be great to see what they're actually going to be able to accomplish. So thank you, David, as always. And for all of you that are watching and uh, listening or are going to be catching us on the replay, thank you as always for making my EdTech life what it is today. And as always, please make sure you visit our website at myedtech.life, myedtech.life. 
Make sure you check out all our previous episodes. We've had some amazing guests throughout um, the years or yeah, actually years since April 2020. Make sure you check out all those episodes. You're going to connect with some wonderful educators that are definitely pushing the needle forward in education and you can definitely, uh, you know, gain a lot of knowledge from them. And also, please make sure you stop by our store as well. Support the show. You know, we've got some great shirts for men, women, all sizes, all shapes, anything. We've got you covered and it'd be a great way to support the show. And please also uh, connect with us, you know, on all social media at my ed tech life reach out to us as well if you ever have any questions or any help uh, with anything connect with us and if we can't get the answer we'll definitely connect you with somebody that can and thank you so much for everything next week we're gonna have a wonderful lineup as well you know even though i'm on vacation podcasting is a way that i recharge my batteries as well so look forward to those shows that will be coming up next week but as always my friends until next time Don't forget, right there, stay techie.